Um, thanks for the, the opportunity to talk today. Uh, I think this is the first webinar I've ever given, so we'll see if all the technology behaves and it all works out. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, well, atmosphere, aerosol and access. Um, so it's a bit of an insight into some work I've been doing uh, with, with colleagues over the last uh, uh, two or three years or so, um, some of which has been uh, funded by the uh, Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub. Um, significant parts have been funded by the ALC Centre of Excellence for Climate System Science. Um, and I'll be showing a few plots uh, generated by colleagues from uh, NIWA in New Zealand and the University of Melbourne. Um, and I'll give, give credit and acknowledgement for those as we go through. So, uh, hoping to change. My computer's just frozen, so now I can't change the slides, which is not great. There we go. So, uh, as I say, there, this, this uh, talk, atmosphere, atmosphere, aerosol, and access, um, will be in three parts. So, I'm going to talk about um, green aerosol and its role in the Earth system. Um, I'm going to talk about what the stratospheric ozone hole, and in particular recovering stratospheric ozone hole, could mean for uh, for climate, in particular Australian climate. And uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, the, the tools I've been using for this work, and that comes right at the end, so there's only a few slides on that. So most of the focus is away from the technical stuff and onto the interesting science stuff with any look. And I think Jeff has got his microphone open. Jeff? Oh, have I? Beg your pardon. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. <laughs> there we go. So yeah, part one, marine aerosol. So I really like this image of uh, a breaking waves, and um, hopefully if you're looking at a, a reasonable quality image, you'll see that um, it uh, um, looks like a fairly windy wind wind down the ocean, and there's a fair bit of um, sea spray being sort of dragged off the top of that wave. Um, and now that is a really tangible example of, of, of aerosol, and it's particular marine aerosol. Um, so um, just just keep that in mind, and you'll know what um, you'll know exactly the what I talk about. If you live near the beach on a windy day, you go for a walk, you'll be able to taste that sort of sea salty taste in the air. You can actually taste it. That is all that is all aerosol. So that's a rather extreme case of, of aerosol emission, but it's it's a quite a tangible one. Um, so we don't normally hear much about aerosol and its role in the Earth system. Um, perhaps we are starting to. Um, in, in recent years, but when I say aerosol, I obviously don't mean the stuff that comes out of a you know a squirty um, a squirty can. Uh, I'm talking about um, aerosol particles, which are liquid solid particles that are suspended in a gas. Um, the reason we care about them in a, in a climate context is that because uh, they they directly and indirectly uh, interact with the Earth's radiation budget. And I'll give a few examples of that a little bit a little bit later on. Um, there's a, an extreme case um, of what aerosol does to the sun's radiation, if you consider that photo in the bottom left. I'm not sure if everyone can see my mouse. Um, but that is from the Sydney dust storm in 2009. So that's the Sydney, uh, the Sydney heart of a bridge during that dust storm in 2009. Um, so you can see that it's, um, there's no filters or fancy Instagram um, gadgetry attached to that photo. That is as it was. Um, that orange colour is caused by dust, so it's very clearly affecting the sunlight um, and the, the, obviously the air quality as well um, at that particular day. So that's, those are a couple of examples, extreme examples of what aerosol are. Um, we didn't really categorise aerosol into uh, well two types, primary and secondary aerosol. Primary aerosol would be those aerosol that are coming from the top of the waves, so those um, um, they're, they're particles as they leave the Earth's surface, if you like, whereas secondary aerosol is a little bit more complicated in that um, the, it forms from a, a precursor gas, so uh, there's, there's a wide variety of examples, but um, uh, sulfur gases are the, the, the dominant ones. And after undergoing some processing in the atmosphere, the, um, that sulfur, sulfur gas turns into an aerosol in the atmosphere. So there's two broad categories, primary and secondary, and there are also natural and anthropogenic sources uh, of aerosol. Um, so just to, to highlight in the cartoon below, so um, on the marine side, and I hope you can see the, the cursor there, there's obviously that sea salt emission, that sea spray emission, so picture that breaking wave, 
There's also a gas called, that, sorry, the sea salt is a primary emission, uh, a primary aerosol. There's also a gas called dimethyl sulfide, which undergoes oxidation to H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid, um, and then, whoops, uh, and then onwards to, to form aerosol. And that is an example of uh, a secondary aerosol uh, uh, formation pathway. Um, we also get aerosol from uh, such things as volcanoes, uh, forest fires. You know, if you picture the smoke off a coming off a forest fire, you'll know exactly what an aerosol is if you, you picture that. Um, uh, from industrial sources, um, as well as natural sources uh, on land, so mineral dust. Um, in the case of that Sydney Harbour uh, episode. Um, and, the, and again, I'll come back to this uh, in, a, in a few slides later on, but the, uh, the aerosol particles interact directly with um, the incoming solar radiation um, to affect the Earth's radiation budget, and they also affect the opt optical properties of clouds, which I'll explore more in a slide or two. So what makes aerosol both really, really difficult and sort of really fascinating is that the, the, the well, the complexity of it is that uh, um, aerosols span, um, or aerosol particles can span a huge range in size. So there's two here, the plots and the units are a little bit um, convoluted. Uh, the point is, across the bottom, we have the diameter of particles. Um, and um, you can see that uh, the left-hand edge, um, the diameter of particles can go down to sort of 10 nanometers. And one nanometer is one billionth of a meter, so or uh, a millionth of a millimeter, if you like. So very, very small particles, and they span five or six orders of magnitude all the way up to 10,000 nanometers. So in that plot on the left, you'll see there's a representation of number and volume. So smaller particles tend to dominate the aerosol number, and large particles tend to dominate the, the aerosol volume and therefore the mass. Um, and um, the interesting stuff happens where they meet in the middle, really. Uh, <clears throat> so as well as spanning, you know, those five or six orders of magnitude, which makes them difficult to, to measure and difficult to, difficult to, to simulate, um, aerosol particles, uh, I think I've already hinted at, uh, can be made up of uh, any mix of, well, we've got sea salt, mineral dust, organic matter, sulfate, black carbon and soot, and water. Um, so the, the four images in the bottom right are um, electron photographs, electron microscope photographs of different types of aerosol particles. So the, the one at the top left is volcanic ash, and you can see it looks quite fragmented and fractured. Uh, there's pollen on the top right, and there, there's an extreme example of, uh, uh, of, of aerosol if, anyone's, uh, if anyone suffers from hay fever like me. On the bottom left um, are um, sea salt crystal, uh, crystals. So the aerosol um, there look quite cubic, and that's because um, the dominant um, salt in sea salt is sodium chloride, the standard table salt, has a, has a cubic form, and you can see that in, the, in those images. And on the bottom right is um, soot, uh, I think from biomass burning, so a wildfire, if you like. And you can see they all have a variety of different shapes, and uh, the scales aren't on there, but they span a variety of different, different sizes as well. <coughs> So we care about um, aerosol because it, um, as I say, it interacts with um, um, incoming solar radiation. In particular, um, directly, uh, and I've lost the, the cursor so I can't point very effectively, there it is. So incoming solar radiation is scattered and reflected directly by an aerosol layer, uh, which of course has an impact on the amount of radiation, solar radiation being received at the surface. There's also this, that is the direct effect. There's also a semi-direct effect where an aerosol layer is warmed by incoming solar radiation, and therefore the local atmosphere is warmed, which has impacts or implications for um, the formation of clouds in that area. Um, slightly more complicated end of uh, aerosol interactions involve clouds. Anything involving clouds in, uh, in, in climate is, is complicated. That's, that's my fundamental understanding of it. So uh, in the case of um, and I've lost my mouse cursor again, never mind. In the case of that cloud albedo effect, incoming solar radiation um, hits the cloud, which is a collection of water droplets, and bounces back. Um, the, the number of cloud droplets, and therefore the number of aerosol particles within that cloud, can 
um, impacts how much of that solar radiation is bounced back and therefore impacts how much of that solar radiation is uh, received at the surface. And then on the right hand side, um, the number of aerosol particles and the number of cloud droplets directly affects how long uh, a cloud exists for and how much and when it rains. Um, so the, the impact of aerosol are quite profound on, on climate is the, uh, the message from that slide. So this is the ubiquitous um, aerosol, uh, sorry, radiative forcing um, summary from the IPCC uh, AR5 report. Um, so I don't think it's possible to give a climate talk without including at least one reference to this slide. So here it is. Um, so uh, just just briefly, I'm sure everyone's seen it um, already or is familiar with it. Uh, but at the top, the top four bars represent well mixed greenhouse gases, CO2 the most prominent along there, um, which has a radiative forcing of around about 1.6, 1.7 watts per square meter. Um, and then there's, there's methane and a couple of other um, uh, greenhouse gases on there as well. And just to draw your attention to the, the, the final column on the right hand side, the level of confidence, all of those greenhouse gases are marked as, um, as having very high or high uh, levels of confidence in our scientific understanding. If we um, cast our eyes a little bit further down towards um, uh, past the, uh, the the middle sort of section into the aerosol and precursor sort of section of that uh, that table, you can see first of all for, uh, centered around that zero line, the aerosol. Um, I'm trying to get the mouse cursor back, the aerosol um, can have depending on what kind of aerosol it is, either a warming effect or a cooling effect. So black carbon, picture a black surface, it absorbs, um, absorbs solar radiation. The same is true of black carbon aerosol you know, soot in the atmosphere. It actually warms, uh, warms the atmosphere. Um, but that's dominated by um, the, the sort of cooling impact of other aerosols, so mineral dust and sulfates uh, in particular. Um, Notice there is a wide range of uncertainty uh, denoted by that, and, uh, by that error bar. Um, the next line below is uh, what happens when clouds get involved. Um, so there's a, the, the effect of aerosol, or the climate effect of aerosol um, when clouds are involved is a net cooling of around one watt per square meter. So that's a significant offset compared to um, you know, the 1.7 watts per square meter or so from, from carbon dioxide. Notice, um, however, the really large uh, uncertainty range given um, um, in that bar. It's, it's nearly three times the size of the actual magnitude of the, um, uh, the effect itself. And notice that this is the only low level of confidence within that whole spectrum of different climate forcing agents. Um, so it basically uh, sets the background for or the motivation for a lot of aerosol um, study as regards or in the context of climate science, we just uh, it's just very hard to measure, very hard to, to simulate, uh, but still very very important. So, um, well mixed greenhouse gases, um, your carbon dioxide, for instance, tend to last in the year, uh, in the atmosphere for um, orders of years. So, where the actual emission is is um, you know where the actual source of the carbon dioxide is. Um, is only a um, uh, second order um, effect on climate. Aerosol um, tends to have a lifetime of only a few days or a week or two at most, meaning where it, um, where it is emitted is where it tends to have the climate impact. So the, uh, the image at the top right, um, hopefully you can see um, sort of Asia highlighted in red there, that's uh, signifying a lot of aerosol. There's, um, <coughs> excuse me. There's some red patches uh, around the Sahara Desert referring to mineral dust emissions from the, from the Sahara Desert. Um, but Australia tends to be fairly lightly loaded in terms of aerosol burden. Um, it's a relatively clean, clean area, uh, and uh, the, southern, the Southern Ocean even more so. Um, these two plots show a time series of emissions from Europe and Asia, and they just really make the point that um, um, uh, or emphasize that sort of spatial location point. In Europe, the um, SO2 emissions, uh, which is an aerosol precursor, um, peaked in the 1970s and subsequently decayed uh, and decayed quite rapidly as a result of clean air legislation introduced in Europe. And that contrasts with, with Asia, which um, uh, underwent uh, an enormous rise in um, 
SO2 emissions and a continuing rise um, through through the 2000s. <clears throat> so focusing back on marine aerosol and, and in particular this gas called dimethyl sulfide. So DMS actually comes from um, uh, little beasties in the ocean called phytoplankton. Some phytoplankton emit, emit DMS, some don't. Uh, so there's an interesting story there. Um, but we're interested in, in DMS because it formed aerosol. So um, this, uh, this, this slide comes with a health warning because um, this, is what I, this is the slide I show when I try to scare, uh, scare people about the complexity of aerosol science. So what I'm about to show is actually a simplified model representation of the fate of sulfur in the atmosphere. And I say it's simplified because um, it neglects all other sources of, um, uh, of aerosol as well. So that's obviously a little bit too complicated to, to wrap our head around, so we'll look at a slightly simple, simpler schematic. So we'd start with the uh, emission of DMS from the ocean to the atmosphere. Um, in the atmosphere, that DMS is oxidized and forms uh, sulfur dioxide SO2 and uh, sulfuric acid H2SO4. Um, and then there are two sort of parallel fates um, of that sulfur uh, in the atmosphere. Namely, it can grow CCN or it can form new CCN. Um, and collectively, those two parallel processes increase the number of cloud condensation nuclei, or CCN. So at the heart of every cloud droplet is a, 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 a CCN, a cloud condensation nucleus. Without that nucleus, the cloud droplet just cannot form. Um, the number of cloud droplets affects, um, or is significant, uh, because it affects the amount of radiation. And just to, just to describe that in a simple cartoon, picture two aerosol populations. The one on the left has um, uh, uh, fewer but larger aerosol, uh, cloud droplets compared to the population on the right, which has more but smaller aerosol droplets. And the volume of water between those two populations is the same. So we have some incoming solar radiation. Um, in the case of the, the fewer and larger cloud droplets, there's actually a smaller surface area, meaning um, less solar radiation is reflected or scattered. Um, compare that with the population on the right, which has more and smaller cloud droplets, meaning a larger droplet surface area, more of that uh, incoming solar radiation is scattered back out to space. So the number of uh, aerosol directly affects um, how bright, if you like, a cloud actually is with, uh, with impacts for for, for climate and actually further impacts on rainfall and cloud lifetime. So these are, this is work done by Sonia Fiddes at the University of Melbourne. Um, so she, she, using, she is using the Access UKCA model, um, and I won't describe that in de detail, but I'll come back to it later on. What it is is the Australian co uh, Composition Climate Model. So it's got a complete representation of aerosol, and Sonia was using it to, um, to examine um, the effect of, or the role of DMS on clouds, radiation, and precipitation. So uh, on the left is a, is a plot of the number of, uh, the concentration of the uh, cloud condensation nuclei. Um, you can see um, um, terrestrial areas tend to have more CCN than uh, marine areas, and um, the uh, Southern Ocean in particular looks relatively clean. When we uh, remove DMS from a model simulation, so that same model simulation but without DMS, uh, you get quite a profound difference in the number of CCN, um, in particular over these um, this sort of central ocean regions. So it's, it's quite clear that DMS actually has quite a profound impact on, on clouds, so uh, uh, on aerosol and clouds. So we can, that's, that's shown more clearly when we consider the, the change in low cloud fraction uh, by um, that occurs when you um, remove DMS from the model. Um, so there's actually a decrease on the order of 10% or so uh, in certain regions. Um, and these regions are actually quite important. These are the stratocumulus cloud deck regions, um, which are um, uh, areas of persistent low cloud uh, over the oceans. So obviously with less uh, low cloud, that means there's going to be more incoming radiation arriving at the surface, which is, uh, obviously results in a, in a warming in that area, or would result in a warming in that area if we, uh, um, if we suddenly lost all the DMS in the world. Um, so of course, the, the change in cloud uh, also manifests itself in, in different ways. So uh, these, are, these are four plots showing uh, top left 
the, the, the water concentration in the, in, the, in the surface atmosphere, and then how that, how that concentration changes when the model is deprived of DMS. And you can see quite a profound drying in, in the, that area just to the west of South America of 20, 25% or so. Um, and the reason for that is when you can look at the, the rainfall, there's actually uh, an increasing volume of rainfall. So um, um, in what is actually a relatively dry area of year, uh, dry area of the world, uh, low rainfall, there's actually um, quite a profound um, aerosol uh, suppression effect, if you like. So the aerosol acts to suppress the amount of rainfall in that region. So that's um, that's uh, a paper that's currently under review in ACP. Um, with already some positive reviews, so we're confident about that one. Um, just to to complete the picture with DMS and why we care about it in climate. So uh, 31 years ago now, um, Charleston, Lovelock, Andre, and Warren published a paper. Um, which since uh, since been dubbed the claw paper uh, in in nature, uh, and they posed the question, um, or they posed the hypothesis, um, in as a result of climate change, we might have a warmer ocean, which might produce warmer, sorry, more phytoplankton, which lead to more DMS, which lead to more CCN, which might uh, lead to brighter clouds, which could offset um, that original warming influence. Uh, due to climate change. It's uh, essentially a negative feedback, uh, like an example of the Gaia hypothesis, if you like. So this, this question persisted and has persisted for 30 years. So do phytoplankton influence climate via DMS emissions? Um, so doing some work uh, a, a few years ago, and it's been a continued theme uh, for me in the last six or seven years as well, um, um, trying, you know, trying to answer that question, do phytoplankton influence climate? via DMS emissions using using a model um, it appears that there is low sensitivity of the of you know aerosol to dimethyl sulfide emissions that's caveated with you know um, um, the statement that, that, that that's on a global scale and in the present day um, but just um, just to put the, some of those numbers in, into context for a, a CCN increase of 10 percent which would be a you know a, uh, yield a, a climate response that would be significant, um, you'd need a, a DMS flux increase of, of 200%, so a trebling of DMS flux, which is just unrealistic. Um, so that does suggest that um, um, the claw feedback is, is an important in modern day climate, um, given those caveats. But it's still an interesting topic. So another um, less heralded um, source of aerosol from the oceans is organic aerosol. And the organic term is um, a little bit hand wavy because there's all sorts of stuff. There's phytoplankton, there's bacteria and viruses and um, organic gels and uh, sort of yeah, liberated carbohydrates that are floating around in the surface ocean. So it's a, there is a question mark over exactly what, um, what organic, marine organic emissions are. However, it's, it's certainly safe to say that not many current climate models consider marine organic emissions. They only consider sea salt and DMS. Um, in reality, the organics are also present. So, I mean, that was, that was demonstrated over a decade ago. So these are uh, measurements on the right-hand side from, uh, from Mace Head, which is on the western coast of Ireland, so overlooking the Atlantic. So the, the, top, uh, the top plot shows uh, the fraction of sea salt and some uh, carbon um, or the aerosol fraction of sea salt uh, and some other stuff um, during winter and contrast that with what uh, occurs in the summer and you can see uh, quite significant contributions in the green and the yellow which is the, the organic carbon um, at those smaller size ranges. So it's clear that organic carbon can play or can contribute quite significantly to, um, to aerosol and therefore should be considered in climate models. Um, the, the, the contribution from marine organics, um, noting that it makes up quite a significant fraction of aerosol, uh, would be significant because um, the present crop of climate models, and this is not just limited to one model, this is a common, a common theme across uh, literally tens, uh, uh, literally all climate models, is that the, there is a Southern Ocean warm bias, which is uh, shown in that sort of picture at the, the top there. Basically, that's saying that there is um, um, uh, too much warming uh, in the Southern Ocean, so the Southern Ocean is too warm. So that could be as a result of 
uh, clouds that aren't bright enough, so a missing aerosol source, for instance. Um, so this has been considered um, in, in some studies, for example, uh, this uh, one by Mesquiza et al. Um, from 2011, examining in a model uh, the contributions to organic aerosol from various different, uh, that's marine organic aerosol from, from various different sources, so primary and secondary, as well as uh, sulfate, sulfate sources. Um, so um, the, while, while the, the, this does suggest that the, the mechanism um, would primarily be by primary organics, the, the model used uh, there was actually a relatively simple model and has actually progressed beyond that, uh, that level of complexity in recent years. So it's, it's well worth revisiting. So as a way of revisiting that, I, I got hold of some observations from this SOAP cruise, uh, the Surface Ocean Aerosol Production voyage that occurred in February 2012, um, undertaken by colleagues from CSIRO and organised by uh, NIWA in New Zealand. So they sailed um, due east of um, uh, the South Island into an area called the Chatham Rise. And this is an area that is known to be very uh, biologically productive. So there's very high chlorophyll concentrations there. And they basically chased around a couple of um, phytoplankton blooms, chlorophyll blooms, um, as a way of guaranteeing some, uh, some organic presence um, in the aerosol they were sampling. So using, uh, using the access model um, to try and replicate what they observed. So this is a time series for the two and a half weeks of that voyage. So the time series running across the bottom from Feb 13 to March the 5th. And the concentration of, uh, of aerosol is on the, the left-hand side on the y-axis. So the pink dots are the observations. And then there's a blue line that runs through that, and that's the model. So you can see that the model's picking up um, some, of the, some of those peaks really quite nicely. And those are... Um, uh, um, actually influence of uh, terrestrial air masses passing over the ship, so they don't represent marine aerosol. There are two periods um, in the um, uh, – yeah, two periods towards the end of that uh, soap voyage um, where we know looking at back trajectories, um, we can see where the, that air came from and it actually hasn't been influenced by uh, terrestrial air by for, for, for several days, so we know it's pristine background air, and you can see that in the in those two cases that are highlighted in the green, um, that the model actually underestimates quite considerably the um, the aerosol concentration. Um, I interpreted that as a missing an aerosol source, for instance, that could be the, the organic carbon, and that is what I set out to investigate. Um, so there's a few questions that, that sort of spin out of that. What is the role of the secondary organic aerosol? What is the role of the primary organic aerosol? And what is the total combined effect? Um, because anything to do with aerosol is, is not linear. Things reinforce um, each other in, in non-linear ways and become uh, quite difficult to, to disentangle. Uh, so this is a, a zoom in on that second time period, so spanning three days, so from midnight uh, for three days of that second clean period. Um, so the pink dots again represent the obs observations. Um, and then there's several model uh, simulations also represented on there. Uh, the blue is the, the original model. And then there's a red line which represents the secondary aerosol, um, or the, sorry, the, the model simulation that includes secondary organic aerosol. And it's a pretty mild effect, not really much happens. Um, you then have um, uh, a dark green line, which is what happens when I include an estimate of uh, marine primary organic aerosol. And now we're starting to shift up towards the observed concentration. So this is a, an encouraging sign that um, we've actually um, identified the missing source and they're starting to, uh, starting to be able to account for it. And then when you include the primary and the secondary uh, sources in, at the same time in the same model simulation, you get this... Uh, Sort of light blue turquoisey um, line, which actually, um, like I say, is not linear and doesn't represent the um, sort of additive uh, result of the, the primary and the secondary, but in fact reinforces um, that, uh, that uh, primary emission. So that's an interesting outcome there, uh, at least on that, on the scale of that one, uh, one uh, research campaign. Uh, comparing um, those same model simulations against um, actually data uh, from a, 
yeah, 17, 18 years ago now. Um, so a research voyage conducted in the Southern Ocean um, shows when you include the, the primary and the secondary organics, the model is getting pushed in the right direction, but there's still some shortfall in terms of um, the actual concentrations we need to arrive at to, to reproduce those observations. So we're stepping in the right direction, but there's still some, some interesting mysteries to be solved uh, on that front, I think. Uh, nevertheless, we can have a, we can estimate the, the effect of um, the marine organics on um, on uh, radiation and therefore on climate. Um, the global mean is uh, around about an effect of 1.1 watt per square meter, so it's a, it's a very significant um, uh, um, influence in uh, in the radiation budget. So one that we need to consider in, in climate models. Um, and in fact, there's actually been a success story here in that uh, the, this new Marine Primary Organic Commissions um, uh, we included in the UK Met Office Earth System Model as a collaborative um, effort um, between CSIRO and the UK Met Office. Um, and I think that was the first, con or the first such contribution of, uh, of code from, the, from CSIRO to the UK Met Office, or in, in terms of science anyway. But that was quite a significant outcome. Um, there's actually plenty of reason to be optimistic and positive about um, uh, marine aerosol, particularly uh, Australian studies of marine aerosol, uh, principally because of this shift, the, the RV investigator. So the, the investigator came online three or four years ago as a, as a brand new research vessel, and where previously there'd been a real dart of um, research campaigns going out into the Southern Ocean measuring pristine marine aerosol. Now we're, we're almost flooded with data um, uh, from such campaigns. In fact, the investigator is heading south now, having left port a few days ago, having left Hobart a few days ago, and is actually on the way to uh, the Southern Ocean to, as part of a, a Capricorn um, uh, research voyage in order to sample marine aerosol and clouds and radiation. So like I say, we're in a um, uh, a really good point in time to, or in the next few years to, to analyze this kind of data and, and um, really get to grips with some of the, the biases that are present in models and, uh, and, and our understanding of marine aerosol. So plenty of excitement to come, I think. So the second part of the talk um, is about um, the, the stratospheric ozone hole. Um, so um, just as a... Um, an intro to, to the stratospheric ozone hole. Um, it forms when, as a result of um, ozone depletion. So as the Antarctic atmosphere cools, um, polar stratospheric clouds form, and they only, they only form at low temperatures, very low temperatures. These, these polar stratospheric clouds um, form the reaction sites where um, chlorine can be released from CFC. So those are the things that were banned, or the chemicals that were banned as a result of the Montreal Protocol. So that uh, release of chlorine means there's free chlorine floating around, which, um, which is what destroys the ozone. Um, so the ozone hole forms every, every spring, um, and it, it's um, uh, recovered by December. So it only, it's, yeah, it's uh, only a short-lived hole every year, but it reforms every, every spring. And we actually first observed the ozone hole back in 1980. So I just wanted to take the opportunity here to, to address a bit of a common misconception, uh, and that is that the ozone hole uh, covers or reaches or is above Australia um, or even Tasmania. It's uh, simply not true. So this is uh, an example of, uh, I think, one of the biggest ozone holes recorded. This is from 2006. So even at its largest, uh, I'll try and point out, you can't see Australia, but Hobart is, uh, sorry, Tasmania is there, and then it's the, the cursor at the bottom. On the, on the edge of the disk, um, the, the ozone hole never actually gets that far. Um, and that is uh, principally because uh, of the Montreal Protocol. Without the Montreal Protocol, which limited the, the release of ozone-destroying substances, um, we, the ozone hole would have got bigger and bigger and progressively um, there would have been um, yeah, bigger and bigger holes each and every year, and without doubt the ozone hole would have, would have eventually reached Australia. So the Montreal Protocol is a huge success uh, from that point, but it's a, it's a common misconception that uh, Australia is never underneath the ozone hole. In fact, uh, ozone is typically under elevated, uh, Australia is typically under uh, an elevated ozone 
sort of shield, if you like. Um, so this is a time series of um, uh, various ozone depleting substances. So the CFCs are the, the obvious ones. Um, so starting in 1900 and forecast out to sort of 2100. So we first observed the ozone hole in 1980. Um, after some really rapid work, um, the Montreal Protocol was agreed in 1987 uh, and came into force in 1989. And only uh, 10 or 11 years after that, the amount of the ozone depleting substances actually peaked and then subsequently declined. And we're now forecast to uh, um, uh, for the stratospheric ozone hole to be recovered by around about 2080. Now note that there is actually a, a fair amount of uncertainty um, in that projection. So 10 or 20 years, perhaps either side of that projection could be, um, could be realistic, particularly um, um, the far side of that. It might not, we might not see ozone hole recovery until 2100, depending on a, a multitude of factors, really. But it's a success story, nonetheless. Um, some further proof that the ozone hole is actually recovering. So this was published last year uh, and represents uh, the, the squiggles on that graph are a time series of satellite um, observations of total ozone. So you can see up until about the year 2000, there's a very clear um, uh, trend in decreasing ozone, whereas after 2000, either the uh, levels are for the uh, ozone is starting to increase again. So um, it's, it looks like we're uh, um, moving in the right direction. Um, however, the, um, the uncertainty in that, um, the uncertainty in the, the time scale for recovery um, uh, gives plenty of impetus for you know continuing observation campaigns and modelling studies to, to better forecast what's going to happen with with stratospheric ozone in the coming decades, and in particular how it interacts with climate. Um, so these are some plots um, that uh, are actually, were actually provided by Ruth Mormon. So Ruth is a, a summer student from uh, ANU and currently with us on a summer studentship uh, funded by Department of the Environment and Energy. Um, so these, are, these plots are uh, hot off the press. So Ruth has another week in which to write a nature paper based on this, but um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, um, what they show is a proxy for, for ozone loss derived from, from temperature, essentially. That's on the x-axis. And then modeled, and in fact observed as well um, in the black line, um, modeled um, uh, ozone, in fact, that's maximum ozone whole area. So you can see that with increasing ozone, or an increase in this ozone loss, loss proxy, there's an increase in, uh, in ozone whole area. That's, that, that kind of makes sense. Um, what's reassuring is that the, the comparison between models and observations is, is pretty similar. Um, there's a separation in these um, uh, uh, in the, the, the data marked in red dots, um, and I think we've worked out what that is, but um, maybe not. So we'll we might come back to that. So it's really worth talking about the, the effect of the ozone hole on climate. So why are we interested in the ozone hole apart from sunburnt penguins? Um, so ozone is a greenhouse gas, so that means it absorbs long wave radiation, but it also absorbs short wave radiation, so ultraviolet, which is um, um, why we're concerned about the ozone hole uh, not getting um, getting bigger and reaching Australia. Um, one of the climate effects, uh, the most profound climate effect, is actually a shift of mid latitude westerly winds uh, in the southern hemisphere. They've shifted further south in what is known as um, a positive shift in the southern annular mode. Uh, and that has quite profound impacts on uh, Australian climate and weather. So this is, um, these are uh, images and plots of um, the effect of a positive, that is, southern shift of, of the, the winds um, and their impact on, on rainfall. So you can see in spring and summer, um, there's actually an increased amount of rainfall in southeastern Australia as a result of that positive shift in the southern annular mode. Um, in winter, the story is different. You actually get a drying uh, in, the, in eastern Australia. Um, so it's a complicated picture all year round. So uh, the effect of ozone hole recovery um, would be to push um, that southern annular mode, those mid-westerly 
mid-latitude westerly winds back to a more northerly zone. However, that, that shift actually opposes the growing influence from greenhouse gases. So there's a complex picture emerging that really we can only tease apart um, using climate models. So that's a bit of a justification for, for, for using climate models. Um, I mean, the further effects of ozone, and these are more speculative, um, and in fact, the further effects of ozone recovery, uh, uh, there are potentially effects on sea ice, surface winds, uh, and a multitude of other, of other factors um, that we simply can't um, uh, quite tease apart just yet, but we're um, working on it, definitely. So the final part is just a few slides um, describing some of the, the what, I, what I call here is composition climate modeling activities um, at CSIRO um, and, and with collaborators both domestically and internationally. So ACCESS is the Australian Community Climate and Earth System Simulator. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with what that actually is. There's a new version of ACCESS uh, being prepared for the upcoming IPCC CMIP 6 activities. Um, and there's going to be, and what I'm working on is an extended version of that latest access model, which includes atmospheric composition. Um, so, for instance, it will include um, uh, a more comprehensive aerosol scheme as well as um, detailed tropospheric and stratospheric chemistry. Um, so that will be you know, ultimately made available to the, the Australian academic community and what would be a, a quantum leap forward in terms of the capability we have in not just climate modeling, uh, but in composition climate modeling as well. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a few of the, the active or a few of the uh, components of, of that access composition client model. The first of which is GLOMAP mode, uh, the global model of aerosol processes. Um, so it's a, a state-of-the-art, very sophisticated aerosol scheme um, that provides a, a very detailed representation of aerosol than you know we previously could, uh, you know, in previous generations of client models. So many people will be aware of the, uh, the increased computational costs uh, associated with the, the latest generation of the, the access model. That is significantly attributable to this climate mode aerosol scheme. Uh, but it's, I can assure you it's, it's not wasted computing resources, um, principally because it'll help to address some of those uncertainties that I highlighted near the start of the talk in the, uh, the IPCC forcing, uh, forcing plot. Um, and allow us to, to, to really get to grips with you know, the stream observations coming, uh, coming online from the, uh, the, um, the recent investigator cruises and data collection exercises in the, in the Southern Ocean. So this is an exciting time in, in uh, Southern Ocean aerosol research, at least for me. Um, what I haven't talked about is tropospheric chemistry, and this is uh, just a couple of, uh, a couple of plots from, um, uh, from the access uh, composition client model um, in a study by Ashok Luhar at, at Aspendale. So in the previous um, or in the original um, version of, of access, uh, ozone deposition to water was at a very simple representation. Um, uh, our understanding of that process has improved uh, and Ashok actually included a more detailed representation of that process in the model, uh, resulting in a, in a vastly improved uh, representation of uh, the, the ozone deposition velocity. Um, so I won't, I won't, in the interest of time, I won't go into those plots, but um, uh, it's, it's enough to say that there's been a vastly improved um, uh, uh, representation of ozone as a, as a result of that activity. And there's a, a couple of papers there, one of which is, is published and one of, one of which is uh, soon to be published uh, with any look. Um, and finishing off with just a couple more comments about stratospheric chemistry and stratospheric ozone, in particular um, its effect on climate. With a, with a new composition climate model, we can really sort of dig down into the, the effects of uh, a recovering ozone hole and what that means, um, what that means for southern hemisphere climate, southern ocean climate, Australian climate and weather. Um, so these are these are quite exciting times, I think. So this is uh, this is early days in that activity for us, but um, definitely watch this space. And I'll finish there. And if I can take any questions, that would be great. Thank you for listening.